Hey, you've reached the Johnsons. Leave a message. Hi, it's Mom. I wasn't sure if you saw my Facebook message. The weatherman says there's going to be 8 to 10 inches of snow. Hey, I'm calling from Southern Valley University with some amazing opportunities for alumni. Hey, great party. Uh, by the way, you're out of toilet paper. Hello, this is an automated call about your credit balance. Your balance is overdue. Hey, me again. Sorry to bother you. By the way, I think I left my youngest child there. Have you seen him? But then on a different channel, the other weather person said it was going to be 9 to 12 inches. But I like the first weather channel better. So I... <laughs> Welcome to Eaglebrook Church. I hope that you are having a fantastic start to the new year. Uh, we've been in a series called Want to Get Away, How to Build a Life You Don't Want to Escape. Oftentimes, you and I can find ourselves arriving at a place where we, we just don't want to be there. I mean, it could be because of the weather, um, or it could be because of a specific person or group of people that we find in a particular environment. It could be at our job, sometimes it's at our home, and in these moments, we just sometimes want to escape. But what if we didn't have to? I think the realization for most of us is we don't often have a choice to escape if we wanted to. While there may be tons of people who have either lost their jobs or quit their jobs because of the great resignation and massive layoffs, there are a lot of people who want to get away, but they just simply can't. But here's what I know to be true for you and for me. While we can't always change the environments we sometimes want to escape, we can change ourselves. You may not be able to make your whole company a better place to work, but you can make yourself a better person to work with. You may not be able to change all of the dynamics of all of your relationships, but you can change the dynamics of what it's like to experience you as a friend, a mate, a spouse, and a family member. And one of the ways that I believe that you and I can do that is by having a thriving relationship with God. Here's what I believe with all of my heart. I think any person that has a thriving relationship with God can thrive in any environment. I believe that because one of the people who had a thriving relationship with God in Scripture wrote this. He said, I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. What you need to know about the guy who wrote this, his name, his name is the Apostle Paul, and it is written from prison. Talk about a place you want to get away from. Like, if I was in prison, I'd be crying, okay? Somebody call my lawyer, sign a petition, let's get a GoFundMe going, get me out of here, okay? Like, like, I am not staying here, but not the Apostle Paul. No, here's a guy who's in prison not looking for an escape because he had all he needed in his relationship with God. Just imagine, just for a moment, what you and I, would never have to escape from if we had a thriving relationship with God. Now, here's the deal. I, I've been fortunate to be a Christian my whole life, growing up in a Christian home with uh, pastors for parents. I went to a Christian grade school, a Christian high school, a Christian college. Uh, my first job out of college was working as a consultant, uh, helping churches all around the country, find staff. I, I've been in a lot of church my whole life. And I've had the wonderful opportunity to have a front row seat to watch a lot of people start a relationship with God over the last 30 years. And unfortunately, I've also seen a lot of those same people end and or waver in their relationship with God during that time. So I've seen people come and I've seen people 
go. And for some people, what I've observed is that their relationship with God kind of looks like this. It's a roller coaster. It's up. It's down. Sometimes it's upside down. Like there are some people, it's almost like the relationship with God is like I'm in in some seasons and I'm out in other seasons. And there is just sort of this up and down relationship with God. For others, their relationship with God hinges on their relationship with their church and their church's leadership. And once again, having been in ministry and been a Christian for a very long time, I've unfortunately seen quite a few pastors and churches fail. And what breaks my heart is when the people that were following that pastor or were in their church to watch their faith fail as well. And they could actually end up ending their relationship with God altogether. I have several friends who not only used to have a thriving relationship with God, but I also have ones who used to be pastors who got burnt out and just walked away from ministry and, and God altogether. And, uh, and over the last couple of years, what's really broken my heart is watching the amount of people waver in their relationship with God or walk away from God altogether because of how they saw other Christians vote or respond in an election. And they've watched how other Christians behave on the internet as it pertains to, to politics. And I just, it just breaks my heart to see somebody find themselves distant from God because of their experience and perhaps disagreement with God's people. But here is my prayer for this weekend. My prayer for this weekend is that you and I would have the kind of faith in God that lasts for the long haul, that isn't up and down, that isn't in and out, the kind of faith that isn't just ignited during the Christmas and Easter seasons. My prayer is that we would have a thriving relationship with God regardless of political and economical outcomes, that we would be consistent in our relationship with God, whether we find ourselves at a great church like Eagle Brook or, or not. And here's the deal. I love Eagle Brook Church. I love the big C church and what God is doing through organizations all around the Twin Cities, the state of Minnesota, and the world. However, my faith is not in the church. My faith is in Jesus. And as hard as Jason and John and myself and the amazing staff at this church can work to put together a quality weekend experience for you to grow in your relationship with God, I got news for you. Monday's coming, and we're not going with you. I wish you could take the band with you. Just dun, 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 and you just, everywhere you go, you could just tune people out and ignore them. Like, that would be awesome. It's just not happening. Like, I want you tomorrow to, like, have the same energy in the same thriving relationship with God. It can't just be a weekend relationship if you're going to have a thriving one with God. And when I look back over the last three decades of my life that I can vividly remember, when I think about the people in those years who had a thriving relationship with God years ago and continue to have a thriving relationship with God now, they're the kind of people that take ownership of their spiritual journey. They're really good at self-leadership. Because here's the deal. What you and I could do is we could blame our parents or environment or past circumstances for why things aren't where we'd like them to be. And while someone else may be responsible for why you aren't as far as you'd like to be spiritually, you are responsible for what happens with you spiritually Next, I've learned that the people who have a thriving relationship with God, they lead themselves well by having a high level of four things. These are four things that if you have a high level of these, you won't have to escape your environment because you have this thriving relationship with God. The first thing that they have a high level of is this, is they have a high level of intentionality. They're intentional people. They have a high level of purpose. They are making a concerted effort to spend time with God. They're trying to have a thriving relationship with God. What does that mean? It means that nobody is going to have a thriving relationship with God on accident. Nobody wakes up and says, oops, I didn't mean to act like Jesus today. My bad. Like, that doesn't happen on accident. Like, no, these are people 
who have intentions to do so, it's the same in a marriage. You're not going to accidentally have a thriving marriage. We're just, yeah, we just get along. It's just awesome. I don't know what happened. Like, yep, we just slipped into a date. Whoops, like that. Romance does not happen on accident. Like, you have to be intentional. These are not people who are perfect in their relationship with God. But guess what they're trying to do? They're waking up on a Monday. They're waking up on a Tuesday. They're waking up on a Wednesday. And they're going, okay, today... I'm going to actually try and act like Jesus because there's this person that I work with that I want to escape. (laughs) But you know what? I'm going to try and treat them how I think Jesus would treat them. They're they're intentional. They don't just read the Bible more. No, no, no. They're intentionally trying to live it out. I love what James 1 verse 22 says. It says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. The secret sauce of a person who has a thriving relationship with God that doesn't have to look for scapegoats and escape for scape routes. It's not a secret. They are doers of God's word. They are actively on a daily basis, trying to read God's word and then copy and paste that into their life to the best of their ability. They are spending time in God's word and they're not flaunting or boasting in the fact that they read it. No, no, no. They're trying to do it. I'm not talking about someone who is self-righteous that carries themselves with an attitude of, I know something you don't know. And let me tell you what I read, and you need to get your act together. No, no, These are people that have a thriving relationship with God. They're going, I'm just simply willing to live out what most people read about. That's it. Reading scripture and spending time in God's word is not checking a box on a list. I did it today. No, no, no. Like, no, you should go and do what you read. It is a playbook for living and dealing with the chaos and craziness of the world that we live in. That's the word of God for us. And it is so countercultural and so upside down from everything we've been taught. We've been taught our whole life. First place is everything until you read about Jesus. He's like, it's not. In fact, you might want to be last if I'm you. You're like, wait, what? Like, get to the back of the line. Trust me, it's just different. It's like, no, we're taught to climb the ladder. Jesus is like, I, don't, I wouldn't do that if I were you. I just serve people. I mean, it's like Jesus steps off a heavenly throne to earth. And he's like, I came to get my hands dirty. The guy who everyone should have been bowing to is the only guy bowing down to wash his followers' feet. When we read about these stories, it shouldn't just be entertainment for us. It's not a Netflix series. No, 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 it's... For us, we shouldn't just go, man, how awesome is Jesus and just stop there. No, how awesome is Jesus and what would it look like for me to copy and paste that into my life? I know I want this position where other people would report to me and they would serve me, but I wonder what my life would look like if I were to start serving them today. I believe that if we want to thrive in our relationship with God in 2023, and be in a place where we don't have to escape environments, we are going to have to be incredibly intentional. People who have a thriving relationship with God don't just have a high level of intentionality. They also have a high level of, number two, a high level of forgiveness. I mean, when when I look at people who aren't up and down or in and out with God, one of the things that marks their life is forgiveness. They know it is incredibly difficult to have a deep relationship with God and have a chip on their shoulder at the same time. I love what Ephesians 4 says. It says, get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling, I don't know who needs that one today, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Here's the deal, I'm not... Not insinuating that in order to have a thriving relationship with God, we should just live aloof and pretend that people have never hurt us. But I can't tell you the amount of people I know who have been cheated on, talked about, 
fired unfairly, ghosted, bullied, robbed, who just made a decision that says, you know what? Somebody took something from me in a moment. However, I refuse to continue letting that moment rob me of my future. I have not forgotten, but I am choosing to walk in forgiveness, not because it's easy, but because I went to a heavenly father who gave it to me first. Have you ever had a bitter person try to convince you that they're not bitter? Have you ever had like a mean person try and convince you that they're kind? I'm kind. It don't sound like you're kind. You're just kind of scaring me right now. I'm not bitter. You, you, yeah, your words are saying that, but your face is telling us a completely different story. Uh, fellas, have you ever uh, made your girl, your wife, your spouse, uh, have you ever made her mad and you still asked a rhetorical question that you already knew the answer to? Hey, how you doing? And she said these words, I'm fine, which is cold for duck, hide, run, your life is in danger. She's not fine, and you know that, but you, you're just going off of what you said you was fine. No, 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 she's not fine. I mean, let's just be honest. Like, I've got to at least admit for myself, I'm guilty of having told people I was fine when I was the opposite of fine. And I know for you and me, what it can be is a, sort of this self-preservation mechanism for a lot of us. But if we're not careful, pretending we're fine when we're not for a long period of time can turn into bitterness towards the people we care about the most. I like Ephesians 4 because I think it encourages us to make 2023 a year to literally get rid of bitterness. Because listen, I, I know you might work with some people, you might live with some people, you might be married to somebody that you've like got this bitterness towards. And, and like I've heard like siblings, especially young ones, especially when they start bickering and fighting, like, man, I wish I had a different brother. I wish I had a different sister. It's like, and, and we could all get there and wish we had a different and fill in the blank. And we wish we could maybe escape them. However, another option could be forgive them. Forgive the brother you got. Forgive the boss you have. There's people that wish they had one. I mean, just imagine if you and I made 2023, a year where we said, you know what? I can't escape where I'm at. But what if I got rid of the bitterness of where I'm at? I think for us to get rid of bitterness, we have to process bitterness. And I think we should do that with God. And I also think we should do that in a healthy community. Which leads to the third thing I've observed that people with a thriving relationship with God have. They have a high level of accountability. They have a high level of accountability. If we want to have a thriving relationship with God, especially for the long haul, we're going to need a high level of accountability. The people I know who aren't up and down with God have brothers and sisters in Christ who are helping them do that. Show me a person who's trying to have a relationship with God in a cave by themselves. And I'll show you a person who'll find themselves so weary that they can't really grow in their relationship with God at all. Scripture was written for communal consumption. So the idea that you and I can have personal Bibles or apps for that matter is only something that has transpired over the last 400 years. First century Christianity was communal. It was small groups of people getting together and reading scripture out loud and going, what do you think God's trying to say to us through this? And let me encourage you with this. And let's hold each other accountable. We're going to do this thing together. My prayer for us is that in 2023, that this would be a year where we grow in our relationship with God and a group of people. In fact, it, if you've been looking for a small group of people to grow in your faith with, the, the Eagle Brook Church small groups directory is open this weekend. You could check that out on the app or, or on our website. And there is a group, I believe, for everybody. Groups that meet early in the morning. <laughs> groups that play basketball. Groups that are going through cancer. Groups where it's just working women and trying to navigate 
what that means for that season of their life. Yes, I believe that there is a community of people that can help you grow and keep you accountable to say, hey, I know you want to be this person, and guess what? You're going to need some help in doing that. I love what the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Galatia. He says, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person. Key word, gently. Has anybody ever tried to call you out harshly? It typically doesn't go well. I think having a thriving relationship with God is not about being perfect. No, because sometimes you fail. Sometimes your marriage fails. Sometimes you just miss the mark. And what you and I sometimes desperately need is for someone to come along and say, hey, you're wrong. And it's not that I'm against you. It's not that I'm trying to one-up you. It's not that I'm trying to sort of usurp your authority. It's not that I'm trying to compare myself to you. But can I just provide a little bit of a mirror for you? You're wrong, and I want to help you. I want to, hold, I want to help you be accountable so you can be the person I know you want to be. Some of us just don't ever want our actions questioned. But my friend John Acuff says it like this. He says, a person who can't be questioned typically ends up doing questionable things. Isn't that true? The person goes, don't, 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 you, don't, don't you go through my phone? Well, if you're not, it's probably because there's something questionable on your phone. That's why accountability is so vitally important. I also love what the writer of Hebrews says. They say, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened. By sin's deceitfulness. Accountability isn't just about calling each other out on what we've done wrong. It's also about calling out the best in each other in what we're doing right. I know so many people who walk away from God not because they were bad, but because they were deceived, they were tricked, they were lied to. And the writer of Hebrews says, hey, keep encouraging, keep being the kind of person that keeps others in the faith. Again, I, I, I've been a Christian my whole life, but I got serious about my relationship with God um, in eighth grade, and I was introduced uh, to the idea of having an accountability partner, somebody that says, hey, you're going to partner with me, and you're going to hold me accountable on different things that I want to grow in. And it was presented to me as somebody that would you know, help you accomplish a particular spiritual goal. Well, The more accountability partners I had throughout the years, I realized as much as I wanted them checking in on me, they weren't checking in on me enough, okay? And it was just like, ain't nobody thinking about you that much. And so it just kind of, it's like, what do you do to give them like a slap on the wrist? And you don't really know what's going on with me. You don't actually have a front row seat to my life. You see parts of it. And so, and and then I realized that I was somebody else's accountability partner and I wasn't thinking about them that much, you know? And so you would call and kind of check in on them. I remember I was talking to one guy. I go, man, let's try and have a a little bit deeper of a conversation. I say, man, how's your marriage, man? What's going on? Man, dude, we're solid, man. Things are good. I said, man, that's great. I didn't talk to him for about three weeks. And three weeks later, I said, hey, man, uh, how are you? He goes, well, just, just filed for divorce. I thought, what happened? Like, that was quick, bro. Like, three weeks ago, did you lie? Did I drop the ball? Did you drop the ball? Like, there's, there's lots of variables here. And I went, man, I just, sometimes it's like we, we've got to give somebody else what's really going on with us. And so I, I knew that I needed to start doing things a little bit different. So a few years ago, um, I created what I call a list of accountability questions that I want my friends asking me on a frequent basis. They serve as somewhat of a pop quiz. I never know when they're going to ask them, but I wrote the questions for them to ask me because I realized I can't expect my friends and family to be clairvoyant and always know what's going on with me. So essentially what I've done is I've equipped my friends to hold me accountable. So I'm just going to share just a couple of the questions that are on my questions of accountability that my friends ask me often. So here's one of them. Have you said yes to anything you should have said no to lately? Most of the time, yes. That's the problem, you know? I'm nice, and people ask me for stuff all the time. And I'm like, I just want to help everybody. And people are like, you can't help everybody. I'm like, but you can try. And this is like, no, so my friends are like, Ryan, 
in light of what you want to do for the long haul, you have to learn to say no. I'm like, all right, fine. All right, so, so another, another question that they have to ask me is, hey, how much of your time with God has been for professional reasons versus personal intimacy with God? I write a lot of sermons. I write a lot of content. And it would be easy for the time that I spend with God to be about, well, it's just helping other people. So for me, I, I, I need somebody in my corner asking me this Question, another one completely unrelated is just around health. Hey, how many healthy meals besides juices or shakes have you had in the last week? Here's the deal. I drink really healthy, okay? Like I'm a green smoothie guy every morning. I, but traveling, it, the struggle is real, okay? So I need somebody going, hey, buddy, get your stuff together, all right? You don't want that dad bod, all right? So we're going to we're gonna have to do some things, okay? Like I need somebody asking me, these questions. So, so these are just a few of the questions I need them asking me. But here's another one. It's a two-way street. And that's how accountability works. It's how community works. There is one question that I have to be asking them. And it's for me to solicit feedback from my friends. And it's a question I think you should ask your family, your friends, and your colleagues this week. Okay? And, and, and here's the question. Hey, what's it like to be on the other side of me? What's it like to be on the other side of me? Like, have you ever considered what it's like to be on the other side of you? Like, have you ever stopped and paused to consider what it's like to experience you? Like, what's it like to be on the other side of a date from you? The other side of being married to you? The other side of being parented by you? Working a cubicle next to you on a Zoom call with you? Hunting with you? Watching a football game with you? Stuck in a group chat with you? What is it like to be on the other side of you? And I know what some of you are thinking. Well, Ryan, it's awesome, of course. <laughs> to which I would say, are, are you sure? Because whenever, whenever I talk about this question with people, it's, it's interesting, like, because it's a self-awareness question. And whenever we start talking about self-awareness, we instantly think of somebody else that doesn't have it, right? Like, like right now you're going, I wish my brother was here right now to hear this. He don't know what it's like to be on the other side of him. And I just, he's passive aggressive. And like, you can think of a boss and you can think of a coworker. You can easily think of somebody that has never asked this question in their entire life. They have no clue what it's like to be on the other side of them. And you wish somebody would tell them to get their act together. But whenever we start this conversation, you do realize that there is somebody sitting next to you that's going, I hope they're listening. <laughs> like we're all somebody, somebody. Like at some point, we all have to pause and go, man, what, what is it like to be on the other side of me? It could be very fun and it could be very exhausting. How do you know? Like, you have to have some accountability to go, man, some, somebody's helping me understand that it's not always as enjoyable as I might think that it is. And, and one of the things that, that my friends have helped me realize is that being on the other side of me is often engaging with someone who is constantly multitasking. It's like it's incredibly difficult to get my undivided attention. And my friends are helping me move towards being the person who's more present because they know that's the kind of person I want to be. People with a thriving relationship with God, they seek out these kinds of relationships and they realize I, I, I can't show up in the space that I really want to be without a little bit of help. When you have this, hey man, I, there's a lot of places you just don't have to escape. Perhaps you need to equip your friends or your small group with the questions they need to be asking you. And what you need accountability with could be around social media and all that comes with it. Work flirting. Perhaps someone has your attention that shouldn't. Maybe your marriage is spiraling. And most people don't ask for help until it's too late. Maybe for you it's uncontrolled rage. Some of us just continue to lose our temper. and We just keep apologizing but the behavior never changes. Some of us might have secret depression. Some of us might be pretending our way through our life and career. Maybe you have an addiction. Here's what I know about an addiction. 
I've never seen one broken in isolation. I've never seen it done. I've never seen, I've never seen someone, I just, I just got stronger. No, that's not gonna happen. As awesome as you are, you need somebody. You need a community and you need some accountability. I love what Proverbs 15, 22 says. It says, plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. It's easy to make goals and resolutions at the beginning of a year. But what most people fail to do is have any advisors to help them pull it off. The last thing that I've learned about people who have a thriving relationship with God that don't have to escape the life that they have is they have, number four, a high level of surrender. A high level of surrender. They surrender the wins and losses, highs and lows. They do this next verse really well. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. These kinds of next level thriving believers, they trust God with their path. You don't have to escape anywhere when you trust that God has you there for a reason. I was talking with one of my friends the other day who had just found out that he had a slip disc in his back and it, it was on his sciatic nerve. And he says something to me, he goes, man, we're gonna be okay. I went, uh, I don't know, bro. Uh, you're in excruciating pain every single morning and you have a job that requires you to be on your feet and moving and like, what are you going to do? And, and he responded, but I'm okay by the afternoon. I've got the appointment. I've got the therapy. I'm going to listen to my doctors, and we're going to keep moving forward and trust God with the rest. He's not denying his negative circumstances. He's giving them to God. I mean, I just, I'm just so impressed with the amount of people that walk through the doors of a church today and saying, great is thy faithfulness in one of the worst times of their life. But that's how you have a thriving relationship with God. It's where you're not moved by the moment because you trust God's history. You trust that over the decades and over the seasons, it's like, now nah, when I look back on my life, great is thy faithfulness. Imagine if we surrendered our circumstances to God more. Imagine if we were the type of people that said, God, I give you my failures and I give you my victories. I give you my worries and I give you my dreams. You can have my disappointment and oh, by the way, before I experience a disappointment, God, I have already made up my mind. This job, this salary, this date, this grade, or this trophy will not be the thing that makes or breaks our relationship. People that have a thriving relationship with God that don't have to escape their circumstances when tempted to control things. These thriving believers, while they're not perfect at it, they typically land in a place where they're consistently looking at their lives and careers and they say, hey God, I'm going to trust you with all of this. Lord, it's all yours. These are the kind of people that just kind of, just kind of live like this rather than this. No, they're just, Lord, whether it's good or bad, I'm gonna give it to you. And this is hard for us because most of us get frustrated with God's schedule and timing. I mean, just like, isn't that how most of us pray? God, I need this done by the summer. You understand what I'm saying? Like, we got to get things moving, okay? The kids got school. We got to make a shift. We got... God's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Who's the God here? I think for us to have a thriving relationship with God, some of us just have to let go of our timeline. Imagine what our lives and faith would look like if we gave all of that to God. In summary, people who have a thriving relationship with God that don't have to escape their lives. They lead themselves by having a high level of intentionality. They're trying to have a thriving relationship with God. They're reading the word and they're doing their best to copy and paste it into their life. They have a high level of forgiveness. They're not trying to escape people. They're trying to forgive people so that they don't have to escape them in the first place. Number three, they've they got a high level of accountability. They've got people surrounding them that are helping them become who they want to be. Maybe today you need to put together some questions that your friends, your family, your smart group say, hey, could you be asking me this on a regular basis? And lastly, they have a high level of surrender. To say, God, hey, I don't, whether I'm in prison like the Apostle Paul or 
a job that feels like a prison. Hey, God, I'm going to give it to you and trust that you have me here for a reason. I believe with all my heart that when someone has a thriving relationship with God, they don't have a need to escape their life because they've invited God to be in control of it regardless of the weather. God, I thank you so much for Eagle Brook Church. Lord, would you give us the strength to surrender our year, our lives to you? May we be the kind of people that invites you into our circumstances so that we don't have to try and escape them. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, Ted Cunningham is gonna be with us next weekend. If you've got a spouse that you would like to escape, we got you, okay? <laughs> next week is your week. And he's gonna be talking about how to build great relationships. We can't wait to see you then. Have a great week.